Welcome everybody to our Badger Bytes uh, talks. Um, I am Manish Patankar. I'm, uh, I'll serve as the moderator for today's talk. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about today, uh, today's Badger Bytes because for, the, for a long time I wanted to highlight uh, research that we are conducting in our department on PCOS and this gives us an opportunity to, to do just that. I'm also excited because we are highlighting three fabulous speakers uh, who are at different stages in their careers. And, uh, and that's really what we want to highlight is, you know, people who are doing research on similar topics, but coming at it from different angles. And as you all know, one of the goals of Badger Bytes is to really not only just highlight it, but extend that conversation to everybody in the department come up and hopefully come up with ideas, thoughts, and, and projects that are multifaceted coming, you know, from multi, you know, multidisciplinary. So, uh, the talks are important, but what is also very important is the discussion that will follow at the end of the talks. So I want everybody to participate. Um, I will moderate. If you have any questions in the chat, I will be following those questions and ask those questions. Uh, to our speakers, but feel free to raise your hand and we will recognize you and so you can uh, talk as well. So I will not take too much time uh, other than just uh, introducing, um, very briefly introducing our speakers. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Laura Cooney. Uh, we're going to do this a little differently today. Uh, Dr. Cooney is going to start off with a very brief um, summary of the clinical description of PCOS. And then she's going to hand it off to uh, Leanne Bui, who is actually a medical student and is mentored by Dr. Cooney. So that's another exciting thing of, to, for today because we are highlighting a trainee um, and uh, that's just fabulous. And then uh, Leanne Bui will be followed up by uh, Dr. Dave Abbott, who is who is doing using uh, non-human primate models, and I will introduce Dr. Abbott later. But Dr. Dr. Cooney, as you all know, is a faculty in our department in the REI division, and um, you know there is so much to say about Dr. Cooney. Uh, but I think the most important thing is that she is just a fabulous person, um, and a fabulous colleague, and a collaborator. Uh, she's been working with Dr. Alex Stanek on a research project that's on, on PCOS. And so she will talk about her project a little later, after, uh, you know, but initially she's just going to give you a, a brief summary of uh, PCOS from a clinical standpoint. Uh, so, Laura, take it away. And, uh, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm looking forward to this. Perfect. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Um, so basically, I'm incredibly excited to be here to talk about PCOS. As everyone knows, this is my passion. So it's a great talk for Badger Bites. And Dr. Abbott and I thought it would be reasonable to spend just three minutes at the beginning to really talk about um, PCOS um, diagnosis and phenotypes. It's really important both from a clinical standpoint, but also from a research standpoint that these patients are appropriately phenotyped. So my objective with this very brief introduction is just to review the 2018 International PCOS Guidelines. Um, it's a very long document that's incredibly well written, incredibly well organized. Um, so I encourage everyone to just go and Google. If you Google the International Guidelines, it'll pop up. Um, so PCOS, as we know, is based on um, three different criteria, polycystic ovaries on ultrasound, irregular periods, or signs of elevated testosterone, and patients have to have two out of the three of those. And so what I would just highlight for those who see patients who might have PCOS is this is one of the algorithms from those guidelines that really clearly goes kind of step by step with what the... No, no, we are not seeing your screen. Oh, you're not seeing my screen. Let's no, try it again. See nothing. Let's see. There we go. There how about, how about now, now? Perfect. Now we can see it. Sorry. Okay, excellent. You didn't miss anything. So these are the algorithms um, that basically go over the diagnostic criteria. And it's really helpful from a clinical standpoint for people to look at these as they're diagnosing patients. 
And a few things that I just wanted to really highlight to patients, uh, those who see patients, is it goes over details of, you know, what is normal or not based on years after menarche. And so that's really helpful for um, clinicians seeing uh, young women with PCOS or people in their 20s or 30s who are kind of looking back at what their cycles had been like initially. The other new um, sort of update from these guidelines is that ultrasound criteria should not be used in adolescents or young women within eight years of menarche because it's normal for women to just have lots of follicles when they're young. The follicle count has been increased from 12 to 20 um, follicles per ovary because our ultrasounds are getting more sensitive at picking up follicles. Um, most of the time we're doing transvaginal ultrasounds, but every now and then if someone has not been sexually active or doesn't tolerate transvaginal ultrasounds, an abdominal ultrasound is used. And in those situations, the criteria should really just be based on the volume of the ovaries. And although AMH is an encouraging and exciting biomarker for the number of antral follicles, it's not part currently of the diagnostic criteria. So my big plug to everybody is that all of the ultrasounds in our department really should include a follicle count. I get a lot of referrals for patients with PCOS and the ultrasound will say that the ovaries look like PCOS, but if there's not a video clip for me to count, if there's not a number, then it's really frustrating for patients to be told they have to repeat their ultrasound. So little plug. Um, and then again, the reason this matters so much for research is that there are multiple different phenotypes um, for women with PCOS. And as we start thinking about um, the implications of these phenotypes on both patient health and sort of characterizing some of the long-term complications, it's helpful for us as researchers to know, you know, which of these phenotypes a patient falls into. So I do end up um, getting, you know, labs and ultrasounds on all patients, even if I know they meet the criteria by other clinical means. Um, and a lot of that is for long-term counseling and, again, um, for information for research. And these are the health risks of women with PCOS. So there's a lot of them um, for us to think about, a lot of options for research and for collaboration uh, with other departments. And again, a plug back to those guidelines is that they do really um, do a great job of talking about management of PCOS for non-fertility indications, um, treatment of fertility, and everything else that you might need. So that uh, is just a little bit of an intro to get people excited. Um, and now I just wanted to introduce someone who is very special to me. So uh, Dr. Leanne Bowie is our first speaker. She is a fourth year medical student at UW. She completed her undergraduate degree at UC Berkeley before she traveled to sunny Madison, Wisconsin to join us. Um, she first started working with me as a Shapiro student her first year of medical school when she earned her path of distinction in research. She's incredibly hardworking and motivated and has continued to do research with me and has had multiple poster presentations and manuscripts. She's applying to OBGYN residency right now, um, and as you will see, wherever she goes, we'll be incredibly lucky to have her. So take it away, Leanne. Thank you, Dr. Cooney, for the kind, kind introduction. Oh, I turned off my video. Oh, I'm back on. Okay, um, so I'm very honored to be here today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, as Dr. Cooney mentioned, I'm um, one of her uh, protégés, I guess, and I will be um, talking about my presentation, Utilizing the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System, PRAMS, to Validate Pregnancy Outcomes in Women with PCOS. The learning objectives for today is to describe the use of a national database to evaluate ads of breastfeeding initiation in women with PCOS. I do not have any disclosures. So PRAMS, or the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System. This is a national questionnaire from the CDC sent to postpartum mothers two to nine months after delivery. It collects state-specific population-based data on maternal attitudes and experiences before, during, and shortly after pregnancy. It um, encompasses about 83% of all U.S. births, and the data on PCOS that we were able to collect was av available from Washington, D.C. and 13 states. We also applied uh, sampling weights to adjust for non-response to produce population-based estimates. 
So this is a little figure that I created um, to show how the data was collected in a standardized manner um, by the CDC. So each state samples approximately 1,300 to 3,400 women per year. Um, and from that sample, they are con contacted by mail. And then they're repeatedly um, contacted by mail. And if they don't have any response, then um, they give them a ring by telephone. So the PRAMS questionnaire that I sent to these mothers are divided into two sections. The first section is the core questionnaire, and that is sent to all mothers. And these are um, the questions that are like attitudes and feelings about most recent pregnancy and so forth. Um, the second subsection is called standard questions. So these are questions that are chosen from a pre-tested list of standard questions by the CDC, or each site develops their own questions. So each PRAMS questionnaire is unique. Um, we based our analysis on the phase eight core PRAMS file that was collected in 2018, because that was the first year that they assessed PCOS status. So um, there are a number of projects that Dr. Cooney has looked on uh, for PRAMS and PCOS, and I'm honored to be on a, a collaborator on some of these. She has looked at postpartum depression, um, excessive weight gain, um, obstetric outcomes and race and ethnicity, and lastly, breastfeeding. So um, the breastfeeding and PCOS is what I'll be talking about today. So. Breastfeeding benefits, how are they beneficial for infants? They are, um, infants were shown to score higher on intelligence tests, had a decreased risk for type 2 diabetes, overweight or obesity, hypercholesterolemia, and hypertension. They also had a decreased risk for leukemia and SIDS. And then the benefits for mother. Um, they was protective against type 2 diabetes. It reduces the rate of ovarian and breast cancer decreases risk for um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, hypertension, and myocardial infarction and stroke. Um, so what are some predictors that decrease breastfeeding? Um, two of the big ones that I wanted to highlight today are gestational weight gain um, and gestational diabetes, because these two predictors um, are things that women with PCOS have an increased risk for. So continuing on this background, um, there were some early observational studies, and these studies raised the concerns about decreased rates of exclusive breastfeeding and increased rates of low milk production in women with PCOS. Um, so basically what they thought can be seen on the right-hand side in this figure I created. So they believe that hyperandrogenism um, would cause uh, inhibition of glandular uh, differentiation it would also directly inhibit lactation and potentially psychological effects that reduce in time. The issue with these studies, though, is that they didn't adjust for the confounding effects of obesity. So that's where we came in, and our objective was our, of our study was to use a large data set to evaluate if women with PCOS in the U.S. had decreased rates of breastfeeding initiation or shorter breastfeeding duration. So our exposures and outcomes. Our exposure was PCOS by self-report. Our primary outcome was initiation of breastfeeding, and we used binomial logistic uh, regression models, and those were used to estimate unadjusted and adjusted odds ratios. And then um, our secondary outcome was the duration of breastfeeding in weeks, and this was assessed using tax proportional hazards with right censoring from women who were um, still breastfeeding at the time of follow-up. So our results, we had 16,369 participants that were included, um, but using sampling weights, this actually represents 880,000 women. And of those subsection, 50,000 had PCOS, about 800,000 uh, did not have PCOS, and 10,000 women uh, were missing PCOS status. All right, so this is, um, our table one from our manuscript, which shows the baseline demographic characteristics in women with and without PCOS. As you can see, um, women with PCOS are more likely to be older, obese, and white, non-Hispanic. 
They're also more likely to have metabolic comorbidities such as diabetes and gestational diabetes and mood disorders such as depression and anxiety. So um, this table was looking at the um, adjusted odds of ever breastfeeding. Um, and what we can see here is that women with PCOS were at no decreased odds of breastfeeding initiation. Um, but if you look at the BMI categories, overweight and obese women had decreased odds of BF initiation in com comparison to normal weight controls. And then with increasing BMI categories, you can see that there is a decreased odds of breastfeeding initiation with the lowest odds seen in those with obesity class three. So what we found was that women with PCOS were at no decreased odds of breastfeeding initiation, despite confirming the association between overweight, obesity, and decreased breastfeeding. Um, despite these findings, we still support the clinical relevance of carefully targeting women with PCOS for breastfeeding education due to the association of PCOS with increased BMI. Some strengths and limitations of our study um, are strength, large population with representation from all regions of the US. Um, and then we likely have a representative sample of women with, the, with PCOS in the US since we found expected baseline comorbidities in women with PCOS and similar risk factors for decreased breastfeeding as other studies. And we only had uh, missing data on PCOS status for only 1.2% of participants. Some limitations were PCOS was by self-report. Um, we were unable to determine if different PCOS phenotypes potentially have different risks, such as hyperangenism. Our median response time was 3.7 months, which limits ability to evaluate women who breastfed longer. And uh, breastfeeding initiation and duration are just only two components or measures of breastfeeding success. And we were not able to assess for milk production or lactogenesis on set with this data set. All right. Well, I wanted to give acknowledgements to the CDC PRAMS working group that allowed us to do this um, great national uh, study with their large database. Also wanna give thanks to the Shapiro Research Program, which provided support and financial support um, for me to conduct this research with Dr. Cooney. Acknowledgements to Ann Egosh, um, who is uh, our co-author on this paper and a breastfeeding extraordinaire with a wealth of knowledge. Um, and I would also like to thank Dr. Patankar, um, Dr. Scott, and Dr. Rice for giving me this opportunity um, to showcase my research and organizing the Badger Bites. Also, huge, huge, huge thanks to Dr. Cooney, who has been my mentor since day one, um, a true inspiration and gem to the ob department and beyond, and um, can safe to say that she is my role model for life. Also, acknowledgement to um, uw ob department um, for their incredible support of me, not only in my research and my pursuits in becoming a fishes and fishes and physician scientist in the future, but also giving me unparalleled support in my application for residency. And I mean that from the administration to the faculty, to the residents, to the nurses and beyond. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Leanne. Um, so, Laura, uh, Dr. Puni, would you start your talk um, yes. on your research? Can you see my screen and, and hear as, me? As, as she's pre putting up the slide. So, we'll reserve our questions to the very end uh, after Dr. Abbott's talk. Thanks. Perfect. You can see my screen, correct? Before I get too far into this? Yes, we can see. Okay, perfect. So I'm super excited to talk about some research that we're doing, um, and I'd like to just acknowledge my collaborator, Dr. Stanek. So if PCOS is my passion, obviously immunology is his passion. So this has been an incredibly fun um, collaboration and marriage of our two interests. Okay. 
So my objectives are to compare the immunome signature of women with PCOS undergoing infertility treatment to non-PCOS control women, and to describe how these immune predictors could be used to predict pregnancy outcomes and complications. I have no disclosures. So when I see patients with PCOS, after I discuss their diagnosis um, and the reasons for their diagnosis, as I said in the first uh, part of the talk, one of the next questions they have is, where does PCOS come from? And it's clearly very multifactorial. There's likely some type of um, genetic predisposition kind of combined with some um, you know, second hit in terms of lifestyle. But what we do know is that women with PCOS are at increased risk for both obesity and insulin resistance. And that interestingly, inflammation underlies all three of these conditions. There have been variants in genes encoding several pro-inflammatory cytokines and the receptors that are associated with insulin resistance, obesity, and diabetes that have been also found to be associated with uh, PCOS. And in studies looking at follicular fluid of women with PCOS, we've also found elevated levels of different cytokines. The main limitations of those prior studies is that they've looked either at only one or a small number of cytokines, um, and none of them have really looked at lymphocytic composition. So really to understand the systemic inflammatory programming and how it's connected to PCOS, we need a broad baseline of immune measures. So these are our aims, again, to compare the immunone signature of women with PCOS to controls and determine whether this can be used to um, predict clinical pregnancy rates or other complications. So this is a current prospective study that we're doing at Generations Now. We're including women 18 to 44 who are planning IVF. The cases are women with PCOS and the controls are those um, with other indications for fertility treatment that we think are unlikely to be associated themselves with inflammation. So tubal factor, male factor, and women who are in, not infertile who are doing genetic testing like things like for cystic fibrosis. So we are collecting baseline peripheral blood at enrollment. Patients then undergo their routine stimulation for IVF. And then we get um, both peripheral blood and follicular fluid the day of their egg retrieval. And then these samples are sam uh, separated down into plasma and the cells. And then we are doing, um, and Dr. Stanek's lab is running at multiple different panels looking at different cytokines and growth factors. So we have preliminary results from 20 women with PCOS and 10 controls, which is really exciting. And this is sort of a very broad overview, as you can see, of all of the wealth of data that we have. And so our analysis can look at multiple different things. We can look at tissue type, so plasma versus follicular fluid. We can look at condition, so PCOS versus controls. We can look at visit number, you know, baseline and at time of egg retrieval. And if we look at some of these a little bit, um, so for example, thinking about the tissue, so women, um, you know, who, if we sort of take a step back, these are box plots showing um, different values, so like interleukins in the follicular fluid versus um, the plasma. And what you can see here is that in the plasma, there's elevated levels of different immune cytokines, different interleukins, whereas if you look at the follicular fluid, there's elevated levels of growth factors compared to the plasma in the follicular fluid. If we look um, control versus PCOS, this is just one um, analysis looking at interleukin-18, you can again see that women with PCOS have elevated levels of interleukin-18 in the follicular fluid compared to controls. When we look at all of these different um, sort of cytokines, we found that interleukin-18 and VEGF are elevated in women with PCOS, particularly in the follicular fluid. There's trends towards elevation of interleukin-6 and EGF in the plasma of women with PCOS, and then decreased levels of other factors in the plasma of women with PCOS compared to controls. Now, clearly, you know, big asterisk is that this is just preliminary data based on 10 controls and 20 PCOS patients, um, but it's great um, for us to start thinking about what the differences are and what it kind of means in terms of the pathophysiology of PCOS. And one of the really sort of interesting questions that's come out of this as well that I just wanted to take a minute to mention is we were looking at whether or not heat map visualization methods and hierarchical clustering could reveal patients with unusual phenotypes. 
So this is a heat map, and to just explain it a second, we have in the rows each individual patient. Um, and so you can see we have the controls and PCOS separated, and then the columns are each of the different cytokines. So what each box is, is controlling that, is comparing that patient's value to the mean of the group. And so if the value is close to the mean, it's going to come up as gray. If it's one or two standard deviations above the mean, it's going to come up as red. And if it's one or two standard deviations below the mean, it'll come up as blue. And what's interesting is to look at this patient here who has unusually high cytokine levels um, at visit one, even prior to IVF. But interestingly, this patient does not have elevated growth factors, as you can see here. And so, of course, the first question is, is this something that, you know, holds true, this pattern holds true for this patient across visits, or was it just a fluke? And so here you can see, again, looking at visit two, we see the same sort of hyperinflammatory pattern um, in red and the underexpression of some growth factors in blue. And then when we look at the ovarian follicle, we can see the same thing um, for this patient. So obviously the next patient, the next question is who is this patient? Um, and really interestingly, this is someone with PCOS who was hospitalized for ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And to take a step back and explain ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, this is one of the complications of IVF that we're always trying to avoid. Um, patients end up with different clinical symptoms, um, can have enlarged ovaries. We, it's sort of mediated by increases in vascular permeability, um, and patients will end up getting fluid shifts, fluid in their lungs, pelvis, can develop blood clots. So when we are sort of picking protocols, doses for IVF, deciding whether patients can have fresh or frozen transfers, we're doing all of this with the goal of avoiding um, OHSS. And so if we think back to this patient, these were changes that we were seeing you know, at baseline, weeks or months before she started her IVF stimulation, at the day of the egg retrieval, before she um, developed OHSS, that were very different from all of the other patients who didn't. So the question is sort of thinking in the future is whether or not these heat maps can be used to predict IVF outcomes and complications like OHSS, which is a really exciting um, sort of avenue for the future. So next steps for us are to continue analysis of the plasma and follicular fluid cytokines and chemokines. Um, as I mentioned, we have both the PAP plasma and cells to look for flow cytometry, and I haven't mentioned any of that today, so that analysis is upcoming. Goals to correlate the immune predictors with pregnancy outcomes, consideration of running single cell RNA sequencing, validating these results in other samples, as again, these are small numbers, and then we're expanding our IRB um, as we speak to include collection of samples for individuals who have taken testosterone um, to compare endogenous versus exogenous testosterone um, and how that impacts the inflammatory profile and those at high risk for OHSS. So I want to thank um, funding from an ASRM grant and Department of OB2N. Of course, Dr. Rice, who has always been incredibly supportive of our work. Um, Dr. Stanek and his entire lab, um, including Soma and Fernanda, who've been instrumental in um, performing these analyses, as well as Rosalina, Haley, and the entire um, embryology lab at Generations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Cooney. It was, again, a fabulous talk. Um, I would just mention, uh, Leanne, your talk was wonderful, and if you look at the chat, and see all the wonderful comments. I think that will be uh, a big booster for you. So I, I encourage you to look at the uh, the, cha uh, the chat. Um, all right. So we move on to our last speaker, Dr. Dave Abbott. Um, so Dr. Dave Abbott is a professor in OBGYN and a member of the Reproductive Sciences Division. And we really don't talk much about Dr. Abbott's research uh, as much as we should. I think in our department. But he has really done some pioneering work. He's world renowned for his work on PCOS and especially using non human primate models uh, to understand PCOS and the biology of PCOS. So excited that Dr. Abbott will be giving this last talk. And um, I think we'll learn a lot from his, uh, his talk. So, Dave, take it away. Oh, Manish, thank you so much for those kind words. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, progress towards finding a cure for PCOS is being partly hindered uh, 
by the lack of an animal model of naturally occurring PCOS. So in this talk, uh, I'm going to present our initial findings, identifying and characterizing naturally occurring hyperandrogenism or high testosterone levels in female rhesus macaques and whether uh, PCOS-like traits like accompany dog, those high testosterone levels and Top whether indeed, guys, there may be so variants so in selected PCOS <laughs> candidate genes <laughs> that are also found with yeah. these females. Uh, Dave, before this, I... Dave, uh, this, uh, are we are hearing feedback from somebody. Uh, if everybody can mute. Sorry, thanks. Dave. No, you're fine, Manish. Thank you. Uh, and that brings me to thanking our, our team, because I'm just one of many, uh, particularly uh, my uh, close colleagues, John Levine here at University of Wisconsin, I'm director of the Primate Center, Jeff Rogers at the Human Genome Center at Baylor, and Dan Jumesic in Obzangani and UCLA, and of course, repeated funding through the years from NIH. But I also like to see a lab represented by faces. And here, this slide shows you us graduates in the team corralled over to the left hand side, including our two graduate students in the ERP program, Molly Wilging and Emily Greenwald. Uh, and our six undergraduate research teams fill up the rest of the screen over to the right uh, and just show you the heavy emphasis we have on trainees providing research that you're going to hear about today. So to tackle this, we are going to look for naturally occurring high testosterone females. We're going to posit they're there in laboratory housed rhesus monkeys that are heavily used as a biomedical model. And we're going to test a PCOS candidate gene hypothesis as well, that those high testosterone females also um, express gene variants in their macaque genome actually in candidate genes identified in women with PCOS. And these will occur also with uh, PCOS-like phenotypic traits in these same high testosterone animals. So what we're looking for is not only high androgens, but the neuroendocrine defect that goes with PCOS, the metabolic dysfunction that goes with PCOS, and the diminished fertility. What do we find? Well, we had to study two populations, one here at the Wisconsin Primate Center of 120 adult female rhesus macaques that shared so many phenotypic and genotypic um, uh, constructs and traits to us, and as well as our, your, our fellow National Primate Research Center, we're just one of seven, uh, Yerkes, uh, based in Emory in Atlanta, another separate 150 rhesus monkeys there, employing electronic health records, giving away genetic pedigrees, medical history, and so on. And for the physiological outcomes, doing a survey analysis of all these females just once during the reproductively active periods of the year uh, to get one morning fasted series of samples to look at analyses and genetics, somatometrics and uh, abdominal ultrasound, and then a state-of-the-art, well-identified uh, hormones, um, assays rather, and using uh, Jeff Rogers' colleague's latest rhesus genome, which we all published together just at the end of last year in science. What did we find at Wisconsin? We found a nice uh, spectrum of testosterone uh, in our adult female rhesus we studied, and these are 80 of the 120 that were in the follicular phase or, or an anovulatory period. Uh, the mean population down here, this dotted line here, was about 0.21 nanograms per mil, but we divided this up into normal testosterone females and high testosterone females by taking a cutoff of one standard deviation above the population mean for testosterone, and all those above it, 0.31 or higher, are in blue, and all those below it, the normal testosterone females, were showing in red. We're also showing here uh, the two standard deviation cutoff values. There are values up there too. And why am I emphasizing those? Because we're going to come back to them, because they're also almost identical to those used um, to identify a, a diagnostic criterion for high testosterone that you need to pass clinical review in certain peer reviewed journals. Could we repeat this in our Yerkes primate center animals? The answer was pretty much exactly. 
uh, using their population's values, we almost got exactly the same cutoffs and the same sort of distribution as we did in Wisconsin. So this is a reliable uh, spectrum we're finding. And it is so similar on the far left here to a human study, but this time looking at non-PCOS women, they're normal, healthy in the early follicular phase, and those investigators divvied up testosterone into quartiles. So Q4 is the highest quartile level, and we're showing it in blue, and the others were equating to our normal testosterone in red because they were their testosterone was determined by mass spec, as were ours. So it's not an immunoassay difference. And you'll see the mean values of testosterone in the human study for high testosterone are just like the monkeys. We're talking actually apples and apples right across these species. They're that similar and their testosterone ranges are that similar. Okay, having done that, uh, so what else? Having identified high T females in blue here in the two primate centers, uh, they were all uh, just like the normal T females, prime uh, reproductive ages, uh, average body weights for rhesus macaques, average fatness. And if we look on the far right here, you'll see this human study that was done as well. Uh, there uh, in the, the, the lowest quartile and the highest quartile and the ones in between two. Uh, again, prime reproductive years in women, uh, average BMI here uh, we're looking at and the, the high T values are similar. So what accompany those high T values if it's not obesity and a difference in age? And the answer is here going back to our testosterone plots. And now we're focusing in, on the monkeys just in those high two standard deviation values because those are exactly equivalent to those in women with PCOS. We see uh, uh, comparative hyperandrogenism or comprehensive rather high AMH indicating follicular, polyfollicular ovaries as Dr. Cooney was just mentioning. They have the new endocrine defect, elevated LH and, and LH to FSH ratio biased in favor of LH. They have subfertility, they have insulin resistance, and they have endometrial um, increased thickness. Quite a comprehensive PCOS-like traits identified in these highest of the testosterone level female monkeys. In our sister primate center, it's really just the ovarian phenotype PCOS-like that's turning up, not the others. In our human population over here that are not diagnosed with PCOS, uh, we also see high elevated AMH polyfollicular, the luteal, uh, the neuroendocrine defect, high LH, uh, an indication of subfertility with irregular menses and a largely increased nulliparity for the same age and BMI and, and, and population uh, compared to the lower quartiles. So in our women, and in our population of monkeys, similar PCOS-like traits are found if you identify those with the highest testosterone levels. Did any of the usual suspects amongst our selected uh, 19 PCOS candidate genes uh, have any variants in them related to that high testosterone? And here we're just focusing on Wisconsin. We're just focusing on uh, our high T females and just 21 of the normal testosterone females. To cut a long story short, uh, because our um, human genome and, and primate genome uh, uh, collaborators and experts, having done all the sequencing and used various methods to identify variants in our 19 candidate genes of interest, they then uh, analyzed that using a CAD um, uh, algorithm that identifies uh, predicted functional impacts of specific variants if they occurred in the human genome. It's very accurate in doing this if the score of CAD is over 20. Um, I can put you in touch with Jeff Rogers if you want to find out how to do that. Uh, and so we're looking at a 99% likelihood that if we see these, these variants, they're causing a functional difference. And if we go back to our just Wisconsin plot and look to see where these functional, uh, predicted functional variants turn up, a lot of them turn up in our high testosterone females. DEN-D1A has certainly been involved in, in increased androgen production from the theca cells. And we've got THADA here as well. Different variants to found in women with PCOS, but variants in the same genes nevertheless. Though some of the variants are similar to those in women who just haven't been tagged to PCOS yet. Our colleagues now in Baylor are also working with our sister primate centers around the country. 
I think this number is now about 2,000 additional rhesus monkeys have been genotyped, and they're identifying uh, in the same candidate genes the different variants that are turning up there that could be of interest as well, and genotyping animals that we might then phenotype to see if they fit this PCOS-like trait. And just to say, there's a developmental co component to all this. These are youngsters from the Wisconsin Primate Center. Uh, they're prepubertal, they're adolescent. If we use the adult characteristics, they also have high testosterone. And two of the highest testosterone values are from premenarchial females. We're now looking at the offspring and ancestors and descendants of our high testosterone females to see how heritable the phenotypic and genotypic characters are. So we have identified at long last a naturally occurring animal model that's so similar to ourselves and expresses PCOS-like traits, subfertility, insulin resistance. And the gene variants that we can identify could well provide genotypic markers that we can follow up and look at indications of heritability in a well-defined population that because we know the rhesus genome and we can develop and culture cells from rhesus monkeys, we can knock in these gene variants uh, and test their actual functionality uh, in a system very similar to us. So that's the, the translational potential there. And just one final thing to emphasize here, because we found this, it suggests that naturally hyperandrogenic female monkeys with PCOS-like phenotypes are evolutionarily conserved among female primates. It's not just a human thing. And we may be looking at an entrenched different phenotype that we've got to clinically manage these days because of our sedentary existence and our uh, cafeteria-like lifestyle. Thanks for listening, and I'll answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Abbott. Um, so we are open for questions. Again, we are, um, want everybody to participate and ask questions. Um, I, I'm monitoring the chat so you can add questions to the chat or you can raise your hand. Um, so as I'm waiting for questions, uh, let me start. Um, Leanne, I have a, I was, you know, again, your talk was fabulous and uh, really good data. Um, I, you know, that the association that you, you know, didn't really see with PCOS uh, and uh, initiation of breastfeeding. I was wondering if you have, if you have maybe plans of, uh, Subcategorizing your PCOS uh, individuals based on uh, androgen levels, um, because I think you mentioned in one of the slides that there was uh, the andro high androgen would have act have some influence on lactation, and I was wondering if the, that was in the in the plans, and if you have thought of it, or you think that that's not something that will pan out. Yeah, thank you so much for your question, Dr. Padankar. Um, unfortunately, um, the PRAMS database didn't um, provide any um, characteristics of the PCOS patients, so we were unable to use that in our database. Um, and um, you're correct with um, the other studies looking at hyperandrogenism and possibly um, those effects. Um, I, um, could I would definitely would love the opportunity to um, you know gather samples from a PCOS cohort here and uh, look at their antigen levels and then see what their breastfeeding risks are or initiation and duration would be and if there's any um, differences when we can look at specific sub subtypes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so in the chat, uh, Dr. Anthony has a question for you, Leanne. Uh, why do you think postpartum people with obesity would have less lactation success if it isn't PCOS? Thank you, Dr. Anthony. Good to hear from you. Um, the reason would be kind of threefold. So with progesterone um, and obesity having increased levels um, in, or with obese uh, mothers that could um, delay lactogenesis too and the onset of um, milk production. Um, there is also some theories looking at whether um, there would be any physical uh, limitations for obese mothers to correctly have um, some latch issues, perhaps with baby. And then um, third is possibly a psychosocial um, reasoning 
looking at to whether uh, obese women who have um, issues with their body um, type and guilt, whether that has a um, component into breastfeeding as well. So I think that, you know, the, what we found was that it was really obesity as the driver um, in this large data set. And so maybe with PCOS women being, having higher BMIs, that would be um, part of the reason. And this is a really interesting, just in terms of collaboration, this is a great example of how PCOS affects so many different uh, areas. So you can think of collaboration with OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine. We're already working, you know, with Dr. Um, English from, you know, family medicine. And there's a lot that could be done with this kind of topic, because I think we're just really scratching the surface with these national databases. And now what we need is more sort of Again, well phenotyped women, where we're looking not just at initiation of breastfeeding, but some of all of the other factors that Leanne has kind of mentioned, which is really exciting. Okay, was, I think that's good. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Just, Go ahead, Leanne. Um, I think like a great way to expand on this and maybe future research, um, actually is that the breastfeeding um, journal actually just published a paper looking at um, breast hypoplasia in women with obesity and uh, women with PCOS. Um, there has been some reports that they might have um, some breast hypoplasia as well, and we're not sure whether that is a um, result of PCOS or rather um, they, they having them having uh, increased BMIs. Um, so, you know, if I um, have the opportunity in the future, I would love to do a study where, you know, we could have a cohort of patients and we could um, have a, a Dr. Eglash or a breastfeeding expert to look at uh, women with their breasts and seeing whether there is a uh, correlation with decreased breastfeeding in the future. Um, but who knows what happen in the future. <laughs> I was also wondering, uh, Dave, um, you know, in your uh, rhesus monkey model with the high T of females, uh, if there would be a way, and this would, this would be the, like a collaborative study with Leanne and uh, Dr. Pooney, whether you would be able to monitor breastfeeding or even milk production in that group of high T females in the future. Very interesting question, Manish. Very much so. Uh, that well, the answer is yes, yes, and yes. Um, that certainly can be done. Uh, in if you look at the, all of the high T females, not just the ones equivalent to PCOS, um, uh, quite a few of them are quite fertile and have raised kids, and some haven't. Um, and the the subfertility really um, uh, clusters in those very high testosterone level females. Uh, but even one of those did have offspring. So I, I know I have plenty of normal teas. So yes, Manish, absolutely. Tick all those boxes, go, go and get some pilot funding. And if you don't mind um, uh, primates with tails and they're all her suit, so uh, you have to put up with that. Uh, they're, they're an exciting bunch to work with. Mm -hmm. That's good. All right. Any I'm not seeing hands raised, but if I've missed anything, let me know. Uh, so, Dr. Kui, uh, I think the, you know, the your profiling of cytokines is exciting. Um, and I know the numbers are less, but um, I have two questions. One was in the control group. Um, are you, uh, is the control group a high BMI? Uh, individuals without PCOS, because BMI increased BMI and obesity would by itself increase cytokine levels. So that was one part. And then, is your eventual goal, you know, to see if these differences, especially that one patient that you mentioned with low EGF but high cytokines, I think. Um, so that's kind of uh, is your goal to kind of use these cytokine levels as in, in, include that in kind of an algorithm. Uh, that could be then used as a potential diagnostic for uh, either PCOS or this ovarian hyperstimulation, uh, you know, uh, to identify them beforehand. Yeah, fantastic question. So we 
are not matching patients on BMI. We absolutely have a whole lot of like variables that we have to look at and stratify and control. So, you know, we have BMI, we have age, um, we have other sort of health um, conditions and things like that, that as we start kind of analyzing these more, um, Alex and I have been discussing sort of how we wanna um, control for that versus again, stratify and make sure that we account for the BMI. So that's absolutely kind of one of the big next steps um, as we analyze this. And then the goal really would be, you know, thinking forward towards personalized medicine. You know, we have someone's age and BMI and AMH and we're thinking about fertility treatment but how much does this play a role as well? And when we think about PCOS and fertility treatment, starting from the very beginning, a lot of these women are coming in and they're not getting periods and we're starting with ovulation induction agents, things like letrozole. Some of them get pregnant, some of them don't, and then you have to move on to IVF. And despite our best efforts, some women with PCOS don't get pregnant. And so I think it would be incredible to see if we can use some of these immuno, immuno factors to predict you know, response to not just IVF, but some of the earlier stuff, letrozole, who needs to be fast tracked to IVF. Um, the patient who developed ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome had a fresh transfer and got pregnant, um, but that makes OHS symptoms worse. So is this something that someone we should have sort of changed our um, protocol on, recommended a frozen transfer, anything like that? Thank you. And uh, Alex, is, uh, anything to add? Yeah, if I may add, actually, so the, the OHSS patient is actually an excellent example of where if we actually do find markers that are relevant, where this could have really made a difference because this is a patient who had what one would um, say is actually a, a below average estrogen level at, at um, retrieval, which is typically listed as sort of the most significant predictor of hyperstimulation. And so, which is why she was allowed to proceed with a fresh transfer. Uh, and, and basically, if we knew that uh, inflammatory um, markers, either simply as markers or as hints towards the mechanism that is behind the syndrome, uh, play a role in this, then we could uh, definitely uh, stratify people better. Uh, and I saw John Levine actually also asked a question for uh, Laura and I. Do you want to take a first shot at that? Yeah, sure. So the question for people who are listening is, did you identify any women with intermediate inflammatory markers or growth factors, or is the one individual representative of an all or none phenotype among women with PCOS? And so I think, again, with this early data, what we're sort of seeing is some trends um, as we're looking at the different markers. So we're seeing the general trends towards higher levels of inflammation in women with PCOS, um, but haven't necessarily identified any clear cut points yet where we can say that, you know, above this level, we're going to, you know, sort of it's characteristic or something of PCOS. And I don't really, I, when I think about PCOS and you think about the different phenotypes, I don't imagine that we're going to be seen ever really an all or none, if anything, with PCOS. So I suspect that probably as we kind of look along, you know, we have information on their periods and their androgen status and you know all of those factors and one of the things we're going to look at is to say you know this inflammation are we seeing it across the board in all phenotypes of women with PCOS is it more likely associated with the hyperandrogen phenotypes or some of those kind of things which is what's really excited at exciting as we move forward and and I'll add to that also that when you actually look at the the primary data uh, you know there was there were a few things that popped up as statistically significant in this very small sample of folks but there were multiple cytokines that showed definite trends either up or down in PCOS. And so um, there's, I think, two aspects to this. This is one of the reasons why uh, adding in something like hierarchical clustering actually may, uh, may uh, give us more power to distinguish folks uh, that actually have, um, a, 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 you know, basically a PCOS phenotype or, a, 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 or essentially a trend towards behaving like a PCOS patient, right? Uh, the other aspect to that is clearly we'd love to have a multi-center study uh, because to actually try to distinguish which factors are collinear and, and, and which fact, so, so which factors don't really matter as long as you have one of them, you have data essentially on all, and, and which factors that would actually be useful um, in what, what Manish and Laura uh, alluded to as essentially a predictive score 
that would be fantastic. But but we definitely <laughs> need lots of samples to do that. And certainly we're correcting some here. And I think we're going to be leveraging certainly Lara's uh, really fantastic national network of, of folks who are interested in PCS to to to, to get at that. Yeah, no, this this is the start. Uh, what you're doing. Uh, I have one question from Dr. Gaston. Uh, and Dr. Gaston, I'm not sure if you are directing this to anyone in particular. But the question is: Are you seeing any phenotypes with bothersome scalp hair loss? And I guess yeah. It could be both actually, even in the even in the rhesus monkey, uh, <laughs> they're hairy, but they're losing some of it. Um, I, it's a great question. Um, from a clinical standpoint, it is a hundred percent one of the things that we capture on all of our women with PCOS, and I would say it's surprisingly common. Um, I don't have exact numbers, but probably somewhere in the order of 10% or so of women with PCOS probably have some degree of hair loss. Um, and it is incredibly bothersome to them. So from a clinical standpoint, it's something I can share with you at some point. There's a sort of range of labs that I check and treatment that I offer patients. It's in really hard to get patients in with dermatology. It takes a year. So I've kind of come up with a panel of testing and treatment from derm. Um, it's not something that we've sort of stratified to look at in kind of any of our uh, analysis, but we have the data on hair loss, acne, hirsutism, and all of those kind of details. All right. Thank you. Uh, I think we want to, let's do, uh, that will be, I don't see any more questions coming in. Uh, I know we want to end these meetings a little before time, uh, just to give people um, some time to get ready for their next work. Um, so let's end there. Again, thank you all three of you for uh, your talks and for the wonderful discussion. I think what we will do is uh, copy the comments in the chat and then share those with you so you have them. Uh, and again, if anybody wants to follow up with our speakers or, um, or Dr. With, with Dr. Stanek, uh, please do, because that's really the goal of these by your bike talks. We want to increase collaboration, increase discussion on different research topics. So thank you everybody for attending and thank you to the speakers and have a great day.